We are here with Chris Sharp, uh, the goalkeeper coach for the first team of Colorado Rapids. And um, basically, as we were talking before, and you can elaborate, uh, you handle you handle every single goalkeeper in Colorado that's ever existed for the last, you know, 10 years or so. <laughs> that's basically what you've done, right? That's, that's that is what, yes, that, that, is, that is close to what I've done, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a busy, what, this is my 13th year in Colorado now? Um, yeah. But look, you know, as we were just discussing, the first team goalkeepers, the Development Academy goalkeepers, and the Youth Club goalkeepers at the Rapids, obviously... I have wonderful help. I have great coaching staff, which has helped a lot. But we also started Core Goalkeeping Academy back in 2008, I think it was, when I first got to Colorado. And just, uh, just for everyone watching, Core Goalkeeping is very similar to what AG30, my, my Goalkeeper yeah. Academy, is doing. I think you've been at it a lot longer. It's a much bigger scale. So congrats to you on that. Thanks, mate. Yeah, we've been at it for a while. And as I said, you look, I've got great stuff. Um, it's been, a, as we were just talking, it's been an ebb and flow of, of figuring out the landscape of Colorado and understanding what clubs and what goalkeepers need um but it's become very effective and, it, and it's it's a four season program you know we need to spring summer and fall and offering the the kids a, a supplementary program away from their club and the high school stuff environment for them to be feel safe and be safe in and come in you know really work at their their uh, craft and, and you know ask questions and, and get a feel from a lot of different coaches yeah that that's terrific i mean i i think like i envy you i envy you in a lot of ways uh getting to work with the top level and then, you know, the, the goalkeepers at the lower level that are striving to get to that top level. And then the goal, it's like a ladder effect, which is, that's how you want it. That's going to make everybody better. That's how um, I think, you know, that, that breeds competition, that breeds success. And, yep. and um, you know, to pull kids up and make them feel like they've really earned that opportunity. They feel special. They go back down and they raise the level of their session with their team. I think that's fantastic. Um, and then in a lot of ways, I don't envy you because that's a lot of work, bro. <laughs> hey, mate, it is a lot of work. But look, I think, for, you know, the, the old adage is you got to love what you do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and I think for what you've just said there, I was talking last night to a good friend of mine, Phil Wedding, which I'm sure you know at Philly yep. The yep. Union. Yep. And we're talking about the culture within a club, within a goalkeeper club from the youth club up to the first team. Um, but what you've just said there was my main priority from day one was to add a goalkeeper culture in Colorado at the Rapids just in general at all clubs that sure. did not exist it didn't exist yeah. it was like the, the kid was thrown in the corner of the football field and said yeah. we'll see you in an hour good yeah. luck over there we're going to do know? some shooting for a little right, bit right exactly yeah. right and then we'll stick you in goals and you've got to save 4,000 shots in the next 30 minutes it, it, it's trying to look educate the kids and, and the families that we are very important in the position that we play but it's also educating the coaches saying hey look these young yeah. men and women need this yeah. bit of love every week just to improve their skills. So talk, talk a little bit more about that. We, we were talking a little bit off camera, but as far as just the club level, cause that's what I'm dealing with here and, and having the, the kids that are uh, that I'm working with that are watching this and the parents and the coaches um, understand just what our position entails. And um, it, it, you can have, you can have a guy that played <laughs> so-and-so, but like to, you know, here or there and at what whatever level but um what we're seeing you know at at the highest level and what we can help these kids accomplish from a technical tactical level i mean uh talk about that battle you had to go through a little bit and and also you know just this the special need for it well i think it, it, it's a wonderful question and it's a wonderful uh way of thinking i, I think for us look the game's ever changing and, and it's, it's changed a lot since you and i were playing for sure um, but I think for me, it's, it really is, it's not only educating uh, the, the, the young goalkeepers about how important they are in a team structure, um, educating the mums and dads that they need the specialty training. Goalkeeper, in my mind, the goalkeeper is a specialty position in a, in a football team. You know, you're kind of a one-man band, so to speak. And, yeah. you know, that game's evolving a little bit where you're starting to become the 11th player on the field with your feet and the goalkeeper's got to be a football player first and foremost, but I think through the other part of it is educating the coaches that, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not a position where you just chuck a person in goal and good luck, keep the ball at the back of the net. They can actually really help the way your team plays. Um, Absolutely. And I think for me now, it, it, it's, look, you know, it, it's a process. We were just talking about, camera. it's a process. It takes time. But, you know, through coaching education, through goalkeeper handbooks, through webinars, through stuff like this, 
creating a, a goalkeeper culture doesn't only exist with the goalkeepers. It, it, it's with the families, it's with the friends, it's with the um, people understanding just as a whole how important those goalkeepers are um, within a training session. You know, like we just said, we used to get stuck in the corner. And I know you oh, and yeah. I did. Go over there, Andy, Chris, oh, go yeah. over there for 30 minutes and come back. All the ball oh, back and forth, yeah. The, the 30 minutes, you're coming back, you're still not needed. No. So you're just standing there watching. And, and then even now, it's educating the coaches on how to add the goalkeeper into the session. Exactly. Possession, passing. You know, they can be the one feeding the ball and they can be the neutral. Yeah. They can be the yeah. target in the, you know, whatever it looks like. Um, yeah. You know, I don't even think too. For me now, look, within, within the structure of the goalkeeping too, the first team, how many times now I'm using our first team goalkeepers as targets in possession. Yeah. It's so good for their feet. It's so good for yeah. their organization. It's so good for their reading the game, you know, and. That was my favorite piece of playing was uh, I grew up in an environment where I was, I was playing as a field player and I was playing as a goalkeeper. And so, uh, you know, and then at university of Kentucky, they really stressed being able to play with your feet. And we were there early, earlier than when training started, probably broke some NCAA. I'm just kidding. We didn't, we didn't do that. Um, but uh, that was something I was really blessed for because like I was talking with Tyler Miller, uh, you know, of Minnesota and everybody, every goalkeeper can make top saves at this level. And, yep. and it's your ability to connect the game. That could be the difference. It's your, you know, leadership. It, there's different qualities, but for mm -hmm. sure being that 11th player is yeah. could help separate you from somebody else. Right. And I think that's what we're seeing as goalkeeper coaches is that I think it's allowing the field player coaches that are coaching at the young age group to see that also, you know, sure. um, you know, we, we're doing some coach education at the club right now and we put it together. Obviously it won't, won't happen for, for the, the times we're in right now, but hopefully in the fall. Yeah. The, but one of the what, time of chaos. Uh, this time of <laughs> chaos is correct. Um, but one of the, the biggest question that we, we put the question to the staff members, the, the field player coaches and said, what do you want to see from us in coach education? The number one topic was how do I add goalkeepers in the training? Yeah. And, and that look, it, it, it's easy when you're doing, Finishing. It's easy when you're doing defending in the final third. Yep. How do you add the goalkeeper in, in, in defending in the middle block? Yep. You know, and, and it, defending how do I add the, in behind, you know, right. You know, game situations where the goalkeeper right. needs to communicate. The back line. Yeah. Yeah. You get your teams in the middle block. The coach yep. is feeding the balls in from the side. And every so often you just pops one over the top. Exactly. You know are you mean? connected? Or are you asleep? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there, there's things in that, like even possession, we're doing a, 7v7 plus one in the possession. What do I do with the goalkeeper? Yeah. Well, either the goalkeeper is the plus one or yeah. instead of the coach feeding the ball in from the side, let the goalkeeper do it. So exactly. they're connecting, they're organizing, they're, they're seeing that the, the picture, it goes out off blue. They've got to feed it into yellow. They're thinking, well, not only do they, not only are they feeding it in, you know, it goes off blue, but they can communicate. Now they know it's yellow's ball. Are yeah. we getting our shape? Are we, yeah. you know, are we forcing the team to open up now right. in possession? Right. What's the neutral doing? Exactly. Where is the neutral? You know exactly. what I mean? And, and it's, it's, for me, that's sharpening your goalkeeper's senses because what they do is stand behind a line and watch yeah. and communicate and organize and put people in position. It's exactly the same way. Then it allows the coach to go and be a coach, not yeah. just serve balls in, you know? And, and exactly. when you open those lines up, people are like, oh, wow, that, that actually going to really help yeah. my yeah. session, you know? But it, it's, look, for me, it was an educational process for myself as well, understanding how the goalkeeper could fit into those moments, you know? And, and I, you know, I just said to you before off camera, I did a thing last night with Omar from Pro GK and yep. the, the, the people sending the questions, some wonderful questions. But, you know, one of the questions was how do the goalkeepers find rhythm and positional play in goalkeeper sessions? Because yep. there's, there's, no, there's no field players. And it's using your goalkeepers as, you know, defenders and attackers and, you know, within those sessions of the small group. For sure. For no. sure. So. I think that's really important. That's a great point. Um, you know, before we get into, you know, a few other topics, I, I just wanted to give everybody more of a heads up of your uh, playing career, um, your coaching, where you're coming from. Obviously, you played, um, you're, you're from Australia originally. Mm -hmm. So you played in the, you, you played in the Australian Pro League. Right. Um, you spent some time in, in uh, the Danish League, right? Yeah, and then and then I think after that you came over to the states and was was uh, playing for Colorado in 08, I think. Yep. Yeah. So I, I spent some, I spent my early years in uh, Australia. I went to England for the best part of six years for do my YT, you know, for Blackburn and Southampton there. Yep. Um, I then went to to Denmark 
and played for two clubs there, Viborg and Kuya. And then in 2008, I found myself in Colorado. Um, what was that process like coming over to the States for you? It was good. It, it, was, it was interesting because in 2004, uh, 2004 yeah, I came to Colorado um, for a little bit of a break in between our Australian season and before uh, the Olympic, I Olympic team I was announced. And the coaching staff that was there then, John Murphy, Fernando Clavillo, yeah. were still the same coaching staff when I left Denmark. So yeah. it was just a process that guys were like, come back. Um, yeah. So you, know, you, know, you know John Murphy. Yeah, Murph was a goalkeeping coach at the time. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, you. I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure out if we. I mean, if we cross paths and if the reserve league was still even a thing back it then. Was, or we it was. Paths. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Because I was with the crew. That was the. That was our championship season. Is your f- first season? In yeah. Colorado. But then yeah. you were at Columbus. I was at yeah. Colorado. I think the reserve league ran for maybe oh eight oh nine. Oh man! Great sh- Absolute shambles because you play at ten o'clock the night after. The, the, sorry, the morning after the game the night before. People don't understand. I mean, you know, they go to the they go to the first team games. Let's say Saturday night mm. during this reserve league. Uh, your average fan will attend the game, have a great time, go home, uh, wake up, talk about it, watch highlights. When they're waking up, doing that stuff, eating breakfast, we're warming, we're warming up, up <laughs> to play in a game where no one's motivated yeah. other than yeah. either yeah. Yeah. keep your job or. Right. Right. Or in a new yeah, school. yeah, and or it, just it, kick somebody for being mad about it. Right, but, but it, like you said, you, you, imagine an away game. Your game finishes at ten thirty. Yeah, you go back to the hotel. You have dinner. You're probably not getting into bed from twelve o'clock. Exactly. Then you're probably not falling asleep for another hour after yeah, that. Yeah, you're you're up at seven, uh, and and then your job's on the line the next day. Yeah, and and but I cannot tell. I cannot tell you. And for some reason, this sticks out in my mind. We were we played Houston Dynamo away. At the night time, we lost 2-1. Oh, God. We played God. them the next morning. And I remember ro- rolling up and looking across the field, and their team was like Brian Ching, Brian Mullen. I was like, hey, what? How, how is this happening on a Sunday morning? Like, these are guys that are legends in our league. Yeah, you know? exactly. And the group in front of me was, it was me, it was Terry Cook, it was Kelly Gray, it was Jose Bersiaga. Like, our yeah. team was unbelievable. Yeah. You know, Colin Clark, Jake Peterson. It was, yeah. you know, it, it, was, it was an MLS team. Yeah, playing on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, it was it was it was frightening. Yeah, the, I I just loved it when you'd have that, and then like sometimes in Columbus, you you look at your uh, your players in front of you, and they wouldn't even have uh, names on their jerseys or numbers. No, and, they were and trying to name it in. You know, sometimes you didn't know the person in front of you because oh, they yeah. were flown in the night yeah. before because you needed an extra player. You know, yeah. it, it, so, it was it, it it made for it makes for great stories now when you talk to everybody back then. Yeah. But back then it was a it was a grind. You were yeah. grinding like those mornings. You know. Yeah. Man, these kids have it easy today, don't uh, they? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, so yeah, obviously you had a you had a great playing career, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you got with Colorado as a player, you started coaching immediately, right? Yeah, but, uh, let me correct you. I had an okay playing career. A great playing career was I had a great time. My 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 football <laughs> took me to some great places to meet some great people. Yeah. I don't you, think you, I, were, uh, I, you, you and I um, faked enough people to make it, you know? Yeah. We, I, I was, look, right, I, I was a very, I, I, about 26 years old, I realized I was a good number two. I realized I was getting moved from club to club, not for being a number one. Yeah. And it's funny because it comes full circle. I, I was at, at Viborg in Denmark. Sweden's number two was our number one. We were in the Royal League. We were top four in the Danish Premier League. I, I got lucky. It was a good team. Yeah, but I got the move because if they needed me for five, six, seven games, I was okay. I wasn't yeah. the best goalkeeper. I was a great trainer. I was a wonderful teammate. I had good feet, which helped at the time. But I didn't have a great playing career. I didn't reach the levels that I probably could have reached. Um, but I realized at about 26 years old that I was a good number two. Well, and- I'll tell you, there's, there's a lot of people that would trade their – a uh, window for years, so sure. You know. I, but but come full circle, yeah. Now the position that I'm in, that yeah. is probably set me up, because now I can relate to the twos to the threes. The number oh, yeah. one's always happy because they're playing. Oh, yeah. One's great, yeah. One's great, as you know. But the twos and the threes and the fours are the ones that are, are grinding hard every day to try and push the number one yeah. and get better and keep their job. And I can relate to that, and that's yeah. really, really, really helped me over the course of the last eight years. But to answer your question, yes, I got to Colorado. The Development Academy started the year I got there. 
we only had the U16 and 18 team and didn't have a goalkeeper coach. And, and the director said, would you like the job? And I said, yeah, let's go for it. So Yeah, that that's it. awesome. So you, you were connected with the club. It set you up long term. And, you know, uh, come to today, you're, uh, you know, like, like we talked about earlier, you have your hands in a lot of things and you're passionate about it. That's, that's what you want out of life. So congrats. Yeah, that's Thanks, awesome. Man. Yeah, I love it. I love what I do. I love the kids. Look, at the end of the day too, I, I've got a passion just for helping people. Yeah. And if the kids are getting better, and it doesn't matter if they're on the fourth team looking to go to the third team, if they're college looking to go pro, if they're pro trying to stay as a pro, it doesn't make any difference. It's, yeah. If I can offer help and I can do it because I love doing it, um, yeah. for me, mate, it, it, it's, it's the, for, I said to you, it's the best job. It's the best job. I agree. Couldn't couldn't uh, agree more. Um, it kind of brings me to my next question. Uh, how do you view yourself as an assistant coach with Colorado? Does it bother you? I'm sure you've been called the goalkeeper coach. Um, does that uh, specific definition bother you at all? No, okay. I love it. And I'll tell you why. It's a wonderful, wonderful question and conversation I've had with many head coaches. I I want to be the best goalkeeper coach. I have no desire to be a head coach. I have no desire to be an assistant number one because the number one and the number two assistant They have coaches, aspirations. They have aspirations to be head coaches or yeah. and they have specific roles and responsibilities within their, you know, like, like you know, like, like Peter and Kerry and, and, yeah. and those guys. It, it's my job and my only job is to be the best goalkeeper coach that I can possibly be for the head coach. And whatever tasks that in, entitles around that, which is, is set pieces for me, Yeah, I have a love and an absolute passion for set pieces, um, which is great because not many coaches love, like doing set pieces. So it, it kind of takes the burden off. For sure. And, and obviously games are won and lost off set pieces. Right. So it's, it's okay. a very important role. How do you address set pieces with the youth clubs? Do you or do you? I... So I address the set pieces with the development academy. Okay. So that's kind of my role as well. They've kind of just, it's kind of morphed into that. Well, so filters right? there, yeah. Yep. Yep. And you know, we'll take like Thursday nights, uh, weekend before games, I'll just kind of move between the 15, 16, and, uh, 15, 17 to 19 and help them with defending and attacking set pieces. Um, the youth clubs are ever evolving and we're trying to get there now. And, and the reason I say it's ever evolving because every coach has a different idea and thought about how to set up yep. and defending yep. and attacking. But is there a right and wrong way? Absolutely not. Um, but trying to find a unified, now I've only seen it through my eyes, but trying to find a unified way of doing it because the goalkeeper defensively, especially is the one that gets stuck if they have no idea what the setup is. Yeah. You know, so I, we get, you know, we get great questions from our elite youth club goalkeepers, but they're like Chris or, or, or Brandon or whoever the Jeff, the, the, the coach is, the goalkeeper coaches and says, look, we had a situation on the weekend. We conceded off a corner kick, but I was putting, my near post in, my six yards zonal in, my front post zonal in, sure. and the coach is yelling from the sideline. No, 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 that's not the setup. Yeah, okay. so I think there's, it's, I think you know, clubs face a difficult task of right. um, figuring out what their time is worth, right, and yeah. and what to work on, and you're trying to develop players technically for the most part at yeah. young younger ages. So the one thing that gets left out is the the specifics of set pieces. So I think we can all probably do a better job, and maybe that's something we can talk about. Of, just giving them a standard way of, of setting up, making sure your goalkeepers understand <laughs> that, making sure the coaches, hey, you know, if, if we can help them address that, you know, that's – because I do get a lot of that as well. So, you know, we don't know – our team doesn't know. that It's not addressed. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that is a, a major problem. It's easier to address at the higher level, obviously. It, it is. It is. And it's easier to address when you've got smaller groups. Also, like, you know, the DA, you've got 12s, 13s, 14s, 15s, 17s, and 19s. You've only addressed six teams. And, and – you know, each coach has obviously got their different opinion. And, and I, I don't go into the set pieces in those DA teams and set them up the way we do. I, sure. I help set up the way that the coach wants to help set of it up. Course. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and and, and if, if, the, if, the head, if the head coach of the 15s goes, Chris, go and set it up the way that you guys set it up, great, which has happened and they've had success from it. Yeah. Um, but at the youth club, what, I'm trying to, what we're trying to educate is in our curriculum for the goalkeepers is we're trying to give them a standard setup across the board that sure. if they have no idea what the team's doing, they at least have an idea about what they're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, which is important. Yeah. And it's not just like this guy goes here, but maybe understanding why, you know, like, yeah. why am I, why am I putting this here in swing or out swing? Why is this player here? Exactly you know, right. You know, why, why, do we leave, why do we leave the back post a little bit more open? But yeah. we've got more time yeah. to get there, you know? Exactly. So it's just, it's just those, those intangibles. But again, it goes back to the point of coaching education. In our coaching education, 
from the goalkeeper side to the field play side is guys once a week or once every two weeks you've got to spend half an hour on set pieces just yep. just a, a it can score your goals yep and b it's a way to you know it can win or lose your games as you just discussed a minute ago so. you take advantage of the teams that aren't addressing this you could absolutely have a field day um so you know the, the next thing as far as from the club level because that's mostly what i'm i'm dealing with obviously um what is what is the biggest weakness or most glaring thing that you're seeing from a grassroots level in goalkeepers today like the the it, we you and i grew up in a different time i'm not trying to sound old but like what is something that drives you crazy when you look at it? Because I can tell you a few things here that we're trying to change in culture, but what do you see most consistently there in Colorado? One thing that is absolutely killing me is the kids not taking their own goal kicks. <laughs> drives me batty. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're at 15, 16 years old and the center back still taking the goal kick. Yeah. Now, yeah. That's a, it, it's, a, it's a problem because that hasn't stemmed at 15 and 16 years old. Yeah. That stemmed from... 9, 10, 11, 12, exactly. where now look, the, the game is changing, yes. But before it was the center back could hoof the ball down the field and we squeeze the lines. But it's happened through that person's 12s, 13s, never, never did, developed never a kick. Was yeah. Right. You know, and look, I think that's a, that's a big one for me. Um, the other thing that really right now is starting to be a bit of a glaring gap in the, in the, the, our time frame, Tim's time frame, Casey's time frame, Brad's time frame to now is the personality and presence piece. Yeah. A lot that, of that's the, my number one. Yep. A lot of the kids right now, and again, I said it to Omar last night. Someone asked me, what am I looking for in a young goalkeeper? That is the number one thing when I see them. It is how they carry themselves. Man. Presence, personality, chin up, shoulders back, chest out how they talk to their peers in a goalkeeping session, how they talk to their teams in a team session, how they're leading the team in a field on a field on a Saturday. That is the number one. And I'm seeing a big gap come in now because, you know, the, the, the social media, the, on the yep. phones, everybody's, the that's, that's what I see it. Perfect. Yep. It's a very different feel for a human being now than when it was when, when I didn't have a computer when I was growing up. Yeah. I had a Sega Mega Drive and my mum said, get outside and go and play. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that is just it is not happening now. And, and, you know, I think that there's a few things last night popped up and some great comments. You know, Neil Thompson, at LA, who was at LAFC, said, you know, we've played uh, Rapids in the DA and, you know, their goalkeepers always have great presence. It is the one thing that I look for in my gut. You will not come and train with me in the first yeah. team as a 19th goalkeeper if you, A, have no presence, B can't take the, the first team goalkeeper giving it to you and C you cannot serve a ball. Yeah. Um, so that, that to me is probably the numero uno thing that I see across the board that is, is the biggest issue right now. I, I'm glad you said that. That's something that uh, when I do small group sessions, you know, I have certain expectations for each of my groups. And if it's a younger group, it's trying to develop that culture, um, you know, initiate it. If it's a middling group, it's they've been exposed to it. So how can you, um, push yourself to you know have more presence but but when my oldest group and I get it school comes into play they're they're training uh, yep. with their club team multiple yep. times a week it's exhausting and they're trying to do homework I get it right. um, but when they're mutes and the energy they don't bring energy to a session it no. drives me crazy you can't be a quiet goalkeeper yeah you can't be a quiet goalkeeper and, and look we have a saying we have a saying at core we have a saying at rapids Create atmosphere. And I see, hear it come out of my goalkeepers all the time. Create atmosphere. Now, here's the other part of it. A youth club goalkeeper or a young DA goalkeeper has an 8 o'clock game on a Saturday morning. The chances of the other 14 people in your team have been up to 3 o'clock, playing video games, had a sleepover, yeah. didn't eat breakfast, yelled at mum and dad, mum and dad yelled at them, is probably very high. Yeah. So what do you... And, and unfortunately, as the position you chose to play in, you're the one that suffers because you're the one picking the ball at the back of the net five, six, seven times out of 10. You know? exactly. And yep. I said to the kids, look, in the training session, it is your chance to A, lead, B, become a leader, and C, create atmosphere. And if you can do that in a training environment, it's going to stand you in good stead on the weekend when Johnny and, and, and Jessica and, and Sarah aren't doing their jobs in front of you. You're going to be able to, to find a way to motivate them and motivate yourself. And Because it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. Like you said, there's schoolwork and there's late nights and there's birthday parties and there's homework and there's all sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. For me, mate, creating atmosphere and, and, and a presence in a young goalkeeper is, is a little bit lacking currently. 
But I will say this, if you find the ways to push the kids, for any coaches watching and the golf teams, if you find a way to push your peers and the coaches to work, push the kids, you find that your session will, will jump up another level. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a situation where am I more motivated for this kid than they are? Or who's driving the bus for them? And, right, right. and part of that is it could just be an off day. It could be, you know, an off week or they're going through a rut and you have to be able to sniff that out. But um, the other part is, is, you know, identifying is this kid passionate about what they're doing and, and helping them understand that. So I think yes. that's a great point. I'm glad you said that because that's a conversation I have frequently is I, I don't turn my terminology is different, but um I'm big into the goalkeeper union, that, that phrasing and what that means. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a player, as a, as a coach, what does that mean for you when you're, um, when you're having the dynamic between, you know, Tim Howard, when you're working with him and the other goalkeepers, you know, Timmy's going to play. I mean, yeah. it, unless he's hurt, he's going to play, but you know, it, when there's full fledged competition, I'm not saying Tim wasn't being pushed. Um, yeah. How do, you, how do you, what does that mean to you, the goalkeeper union? It's a great question. Um, I, I, I'll give you a little story. This is a wonderful story that kind of changed my thought process on exactly what you just said. 2015, I was lucky enough to go and spend a week with the Argentinian national team. They were in Houston. They were playing Bolivia and Peru in a little nations tournament there. Sure. Our sporting director knew the goalkeeper coach, uh, Gustavo, there. So I went and spent a week there. Anyway, so he was wonderful. He sat with me. He watched my sessions. My goal goalkeepers at the time were Clint Irwin and Zach McMath. And Clint yep. was the one and Zach was the two. We just got Zach on loan from Philadelphia. Yep. And he's like, your sessions are good. Tweak this, tweak that, do this, do that. I see what you're looking at towards the weekend, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but let me ask you a question. What is your session based on the one, two, or the three? And I said, well, it's, it, the Monday and Tuesday is kind of geared towards the two and the three to help yep. them. But the rest of the week is geared towards the one to help them get ready for the Saturday. He goes, great. great. You know, you got you to let the one see it. But let me ask you this question. If you don't push the number two every single day, what's the number one getting out of it? And I kind of went, yeah, wow, I didn't think about it like that. He goes, yeah. because number one's going to be happy, they're playing. The number two is the pivotal person in your whole group. Because if they feel like, like you said, if Tim's going to play and Z's going to sit, Zach knows he's not going to play on the weekend, but T knows he's playing. And you're working for Tim anyway. But you've got, to, you've got to push Zach as hard as you can to get as close to Tim as possible. And the number three will just catch up naturally. Yep. You know? Um, and it kind, of, it, it, it kind of made me change my thought process and my philosophy a little bit. Now, let's go back to the, that year. It was in June. Clint was having a great year. Zach hadn't played a game yet. Clint got player of the year. Yep. But we sold Clint at the end of that year to Toronto FC and Zach became our number one. Yeah, I remember that. Zach, Zach had the best start to his career, the start of six months that he's had in his career. Best goalkeeper in the league, best goal against average in the league, best save percentage in the league until Tim got there in 2016. But I said to Z, none of this would have happened if we didn't do what we did the year before. Because I, it allowed me to turn his whole game upside down in 2015 in preparation for what happened in 2016. Now, we signed Tim. You know, I had the best goalkeeping duo in the league by none in Zach and Tim. It was brilliant, you know. That was the next question. You can delve into that after this point, yeah. But Z, and, Z, and, uh, Z had the best six months of his career up until, you know, and he started out well this year too at Salt Lake. Yeah. But it goes back to what we did the year before. I changed my philosophy to push Z, which in turn ended up giving Clint one of the best years of his life, which in turn got him sold to, and won a championship at Toronto the following year. But it made Z, well, put Z in good stead for the following 2016 campaign and I look back at it and go wow that he was 100% correct with that process so again to answer your question that to me changed my philosophy pushing the number two or gearing things towards the two to make sure that the one was being pushed always felt the pressure and the three was catching up yeah you know? yeah I think sometimes when I set up my sessions um you know if you have eight kids you know you're splitting the goal and you want to do four here and four here yeah um you know, I see body language change if the, if the bottom four of that group are not in the top four. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's something that you have to deal with where, you know, the session is, it's a make or break pivotal moment for that kid. Um, are they going to get what they came for out of that session or are they going to mentally fold mm -hmm. because, hey, man, I should be in that four or but there's sometimes it's not always about the top four, bottom four. Sometimes I want to bring a kid into that fold and and uh see how they respond right um you know what what is your advice for 
you know, that type of situation when dealing with a group environment? I think there's two, two answers to that question. The answer for the coach and the answer for the player. Player and parent. Um, it's a great question, and it's one that I get all the time. And I'll give you this example. We do the call. We do 36, 37, 40 goalkeepers at once. And I go and group, or the, the staff will group the numbers up. That six goes with Andy. That six goes with Chris. That six goes with PJ, whatever it looks like. Two hours later after the session's finished, I get an email from a parent saying, hey, Johnny was in the third group. He felt he should have been in the first group. My mind works like this. When I group the kids, I'm not really grouping you in group one, group two, group three, group four, yeah. group five. I'm grouping you in, okay, Andy's probably the best technical goalkeeper, but he needs to learn leadership. If I stick him in group one, there's five other boys over there. They're going to maul him when it comes yeah. to stuff like that. Yeah. So I need to pull him out of that group, put him over there and let him lead. Yeah. I'll see as soon as that I go and I do it quietly. I do it while they're doing their warm. I go around and go group one, yeah. group one, group one, group one. And they look at each other and kind of go, okay. And when I go group one's going that way and they take off over there and they're left looking around going, why am I not in that group? And I see shoulders drop and chins drop. I'll go and put my arm around them and say, Hey Andy, today you're in that group because you've got to lead. You have to be a leader. You're technically fantastic. It's not about technical ability today. It's about you leading, creating atmosphere and making sure that you've got that group going. And There'll also be times where parents and kids need to hear it. You weren't good last week. You had a rough week last week. You got and a rough week. week was because the three other four of the goalkeepers in your group were killing you. Yeah. And you made a couple of mistakes. It affected you. Now I'm putting you down here or over here because I want you to be the best goalkeeper in that group and show to me you deserve to be in this group over here. Now, it doesn't matter. I, I, age to me is just a number. If I've got a 13-year-old who is good enough to be in the U18 group, you're over there. Exactly. You know, but I think then for the coaching staff, on the flip side of it, it's, it's having a feel for seeing what you've just said. I split it up four and four. Johnny's shoulders drop because he's not in that group. It's just finding in, in between your six minutes, seven minute, eight minute reps, it's just finding a moment going, hey, you're there because I need you to lead. You have to lead today. You need to be talking. You need to organize. And you have to be the best in that four to get back over to that four. And it, I think for me, it's a feel thing. You've got to know the kids that you're coaching and you've got to have a reason why you're doing what you're doing as well as a coach. Yeah, that's, uh, that private conversation is what I lean on. It's like, hey, yeah. you know, didn't, didn't think you were sharp or, you know, that same point. I've made that same point. I want you to lead this group. Yeah. Uh, you're, not, you're not talking enough. You, yeah. you know, I need you to be vocal. I need you not a cheerleader. You don't have to be somebody you're not, but I need to hear a change. Yep. Um, so yeah, that, I think, fantastic point that's good for them to hear is us as coaches we're we're not just doing this stuff uh throwing darts at a board or no, 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 you know no. what i mean this is yeah. pre-planned premeditated yeah. so yeah and especially for individuals too and i think too when, when parents and, and kids can understand look, i'm actually thinking about your child yeah i'm actually thinking about you as a goalkeeper andy that i want the best out of you today i'm, I'm just not going one two three four five go that way for sure and it's the same with the da it's the same with the youth club it, it's there is premeditated thought process to it now i have a very very good group of 15 to 19 goalkeepers and it's showing right now they're posting things on whatsapp trying to stay active but they will finish their session from 4 30 or 6 and come back and help the 12 13 and 14 out and i don't ask them to do that yeah i think that's all that's a culture right it's there a culture. It's that's a culture. the goalkeeper union right there yeah and those boys that, that's your goalkeeper union those boys the 12 13 and 14 see andrew cordes who's training with tim howard and Clint Irwin and Will Yarbrough and coming back over to help me as a 12 year old. And I stood yeah. behind the goal on the weekend and watched Clint warm up and Andy's been working with him and now he's serving a ball to me. It's a, it's a snowball effect. Oh yeah. You know, that's, fantastic. Um, that's yeah. good. So um, a couple more questions, man. I, I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. I know um, we've talked a little bit here and there off camera, but um, what was it like to work with Tim Howard? This is a guy that I grew up watching. Was it, wasn't the guy that I uh, first initially drew me into goalkeeping, but definitely, um, you know, somebody that motivated me, but just by watching him to get better. Yeah. Look, I, I personally can't speak highly enough about T. He is, he has become one of my best friends. Um, awesome. a, a dear confidant in anything walks of life. Even now he's at Memphis and we speak every other day. Um, yeah. In fact, I owe my phone call, a uh, return phone call from yesterday. But you talk about understanding why he was where he was. 
um, the very first thing he said to me in 2016, he called me after he signed March. He said, Chris, look, I've had a conversation with Pablo, who was head coach at the time. He wanted me to give you a buzz. He goes, look, I am absolutely subservient to learning new things and, and, and doing new ideas. That was the first thing he said to me. And I was like, wow. Yeah. And I, look, I was nervous. I was yeah. like, what? I'm getting, I'm getting, in my biased opinion, yeah. the US's best goalkeeper, bar none. Yeah. And then when you look down some of the things, when you have a bit of a closer look, probably one of the best 10 goalkeepers in Premier League history. Yeah. I mean, his run yeah. was incredible. Oh, unbelievable. But even you look at, you look at stats, you look at games played, you look at clean sheets kept. You know, he's above guys like Peter Schmeichel. Yeah. I think, you know, people like David James and, and uh, Edwin Van Assara, guys just above him, Nigel yeah. Martin. People are yeah. legends. And look, A, first and foremost, he was a workhorse. He was an absolute workhorse to a point where we had to start pulling the reins back, yeah. you know, in his later career because, you know, I had to get him ready for the weekend. And, and he was still yeah. working like he was 25 years old yeah. Monday through Friday. Um, wonderful, wonderful trainer. Uh, had, a, had a switch in his mind where as soon as he stepped across the white line, the switch was, it was on. Um, had, the, had the ability to pull people together in a locker room. You know, he looked after the young guys, um, you know, and, and, and to be fair, w w would sit with me more so over the telephone. We'd want to talk about the game the next day on the phone. I'd send him his video cut his video up, we'd spend more time texting and talking about it than we would at the training ground because it was time to train. And, you know, he just ever thought, pro, you know, his thought process never stopped. And it was, you know, he would call me in the middle of the night. I just thought this about this player and why, why aren't we doing this? And, and like, it was, it was frightening. And it actually changed my thought process because I've only ever had young goalkeepers. In, in, you know, I, I had Matt Pickens for a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, Clint and Tim and... Uh, Zach and Joe Nasco, and you look at all the things. T was the oldest goalkeeper I've had as a pro coach, yeah. um, which gave me so much more tools in my toolbox, uh, you know, and, and the learning process. Yeah. But I mean, you talk about knowing or seeing why he was as good as he was and where he got to, absolutely frightening. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, that's great. That's great insight. I mean, just I'm sure, you know, guys when he signs, you know, you know what the deal is. So yeah. right then and there, you have to kind of flip a switch and say, okay, but to learn under that, if, if I'm a player and I know Tim's coming, I'm not going to be obviously thrilled. I want to play, but right. it's also an opportunity, you know, right. and I think that's really healthy to understand is, you know, how many people will have that opportunity to play under a guy like that and, cool. and, and possibly, you know, just, become a sponge around somebody that's been around as much of the game as he has. So right. you, talk, uh, you, talk, you talk about leadership too. Yeah. We'll be in team meetings and video, as you know, video meetings and yeah. post game breakdowns and stuff like that. And look, he was the captain. He was the most experienced player in the dressing room, probably most experienced player in the league at yep. the four years he was here. But he had the ability to grab a room. And Everybody listens. Through. Yeah. What, everyone listens. When, yeah. when he was talking, it's caught. Yeah. And, for me, for Zach, for Clint, for everybody that was around him, even the young goalkeepers, it showed them now. Clint stepping in as the number one, Z going to Salt Lake or Vancouver and Salt Lake as the number one. That there is a there is a bar being set for what you've been around, and, and I hope that the guys and they have I've seen it. They have taken that leadership role and that responsibility. That okay, T's voice is gone now. Who's stepping up? Yeah, is it Clint? Was it Zach at the time? Do you know what I'm saying? And I think for, for me. Sure. That that was it was so important for those guys and even little things like T has little little uh, little quirks and perks in the field he would do with his gloves and stuff like that. The, those guys naturally started forming those habits just watching him do it. Yeah. So he was so influential, such a big presence and a big um, leader in the group. But for me, for any kid watching this, and you look back at those guys, I know exactly why T was one of the best goalkeepers in the world yeah. um, through that run and it was absolutely no surprises once you got to work with him. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic to hear. Um, one last question, then I'll let you go, man. I really appreciate it once again. Um, during this quarantine-ish time, <laughs> how, are, uh, how are you staying sharp mentally, physically? Um, how are you keeping your kids in line? So, me, yeah. me personally? Wow. I, are, you, are you getting the quarantine 15 like I am? Are you? Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'm a, I'm a bit of a workout-aholic. Um, so 
I'm out. I'm, I'm you know, the last few days I've been on four mile runs. Um, I'm actually down in KC in your neck of the woods right now, um, just for a couple of days, just escaping the craziness. Um, but yeah, you know, I, in home garage, gym, workout, push sit ups, push ups, squats, Swiss ball, running every day. It, it keeps my mind fresh as well. Without that, I go stir crazy. Without the, without being on the grass every day, I go yeah. stir crazy. Yeah. But I think now there's enough for me to do here in giving our youth club goalkeepers with my coaching staff some good ideas and thoughts and stuff like that. Some time now for me to educate um, myself. Again, I've done a lot of this sort of stuff here. I'm just trying to help people out. But also watching Todd Hofford and Phil Wedden and Ian Fewer this morning um, speaking and learning. Uh, I think yeah. for, for us as coaches, um, and, and look, it's a time now. I was speaking to our head coach last night. What can we now do? Because obviously our session, our, our least season has been pushed back another eight weeks. Yeah. Now it's time for me. And I, I've just started my list right here. I've got it sitting right next to me. I'm going to start putting together now for Clint and for Will and for Rawlsy and for Abe. Um, just snippets of information. And they're all different. They all need different things. Yep. Obviously, Everybody's you know, different. Everything's different. Yeah. So Clint, we're going to look at the, the first two games again and kind of break down some stuff. Will, being you, back in MLS from, from Liga MX, going to start looking at um, how I'm going to break down teams and players he's going to be seeing just so he can start getting a feel for, for what's in the league. For sure. Um, Rawlsy going back to preseason, going to look at some of his game tape and then Abe, same thing. So I think for me, keeping sharp is keeping busy. Yeah. You know, if I'm sitting in front of the TV, look, and, and don't get me wrong, my Netflix is on before I go to yeah, bed. There's, there's, there's a time yeah, for it. There's a time for it. There's a time for it. You know, working out during the day and then obviously just continually educating myself. And I think I get educated from talking with stuff like this as well, you know, and sure. speaking to people and thinking of things and ideas. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a notebook. I'm, I'm, look, I'll pull it up right now, mate. I'm a, I'm a notes. <laughs> yeah. Nugget. Every time I get off the phone to someone, I'm writing things down and, and to a point where I've got to organize my thought process here yeah. because I've got so much in the last two weeks of just being inside. Yeah. Um, but look, staying sharp, I think it's just working and having a process again like you do on a football field to what you're trying to achieve i think this is a really uh it's obviously devastating to not be on the field with my goalkeepers yep. i'm sure it is for you um i i'm trying to look at it as a perfect opportunity to introduce more tactical ideas to yep. the goalkeepers um you know i'm working on getting out the all the clips from the first two sporting games mm -hmm. um and uh i'll be jumping on a call hopefully next week with tim as well um, mm -hmm. and talking, you know, just about everything, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, I think that, you know, this is an important thing to, to look at the silver lining and, and a perfect opportunity to maybe get some extra fitness in, yeah. get away from the soccer yeah. ball, but also, yeah. you know, I mean, be on the soccer ball, but get your mind fresh. Right. Um, so I agree. I agree. Man. Yeah. The other part of these two, these kids can now see what it's like, what they should be doing when they have spare time. So yeah. when yeah. things go back to normal and they're at school, Look, probably the majority of the kids right now are going from this into the summer break. Yeah. They might have a two or three week period if this starts to settle down that they have back at school. Yeah. But in the summertime, I see a biggest dip in form from May through August because yeah. the, the season finishes, they do a camp Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, they're doing nothing. They expect to be good again on the, on the you know what I mean? And I think. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you're back at it, right? 100%. Yeah. And this should be giving them thought and ideas on how to kill their time and best spend their time when they have free time. It's, not, in, it's not inside watching Netflix and, and on the PlayStation. But there's, a, there's a wonderful world out there to go and yeah. improve your craft. Now, now, don't come and ask us questions as coaches and say, but coach, why didn't I make this team? When Johnny was working his backside off through that time yeah. and Johnny jumped you. Yeah. You know, and that, that, that to me, they're, they're wonderful learning times, but I think in this time for the young goalkeepers, of any age group, any, any level. You know, yeah. I was talking to Clint yesterday, day before yesterday, and he's in his garage working out with 50 pound puppy food bags. And that's what he's got. <laughs> you know, like being creative. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whatever, like, yeah. It's, it's like, it's whatever it takes. Yeah. Rocky Balboa in there, you know. Rocky Balboa. Munching, Balboa. munching things of meat, you know. Yeah, exactly right. So. <laughs> no, man, I, I think that's great. I think, um, like you said, it's a mentality, and hopefully yep. we all just relax a little bit and, and adopt the right mentality. and. Yep. Um, man, I just really appreciate your time, Chris. And, and I know you've been making the rounds like Good Morning America and stuff. Uh, basically. Uh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but um, I wish you and your goalkeepers the best, um, you know, the best of luck during this time. And hopefully everyone stays safe. And then 
when you come to Kansas City and, and the fans, some of my some of my kids are watching you warm up the goalkeepers. Yep. Uh, maybe they can give you a little shout out as well. So Please. yeah, and look, I'll say this to I'll say this to everyone. Last night I did this thing with Omar and a couple of days ago some other people, but I have time as well right now. If if you know anyone wants to, to look call goalkeeper academy up on, on Instagram, follow us, throw some stuff in the DM. I'm happy to answer questions, you know, and last night we had 50 odd questions come through. I'll spend my time working, you know, to get through those questions. So call goalkeeper Academy on Instagram, look it up and then just DM me with any questions. I'm happy to help. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, really impressed with what you've been able to do there. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I'm trying to do here as well. Um, so uh, obviously appreciate all of the insight and uh, look forward to talking with you again. So appreciate Absolutely. your time. Anytime. Thanks Andy. All right. Bye. Bye.